Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. This is your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight, the story of a crime against the home, kidnapping. Just as it takes a special type of criminal to become a Hitler, so it takes a special type to become a kidnapper. Someone who refuses to face the fact that eventually all kidnappers and those who aid them will be hunted down by the FBI until they are dead or brought to justice. Such criminals aren't born, they're made. Created by environment, by society, by circumstance. And in one case, a kidnapper was created by something else too, by his wife. Sally. Hmm? Ain't that enough for today? No. That last round was No, Frank. I'm tired. Then rest for a minute. You've been dragging me out here every day for two weeks. I'm a good enough shot. For small time holdups, maybe. That bank job was no. You don't have to tell me about that bank job, Frank. That was my idea. Just like everything's been my idea. Okay. If it's all yours, take the gun too. Oh, darling, darling. You know I didn't mean it that way. Mm. You know, I plan everything just for you. Besides, I couldn't do it all myself. If you could, you would. Don't be silly. I don't know what the point of all this target practice is anyway. It's going to give you a reputation. With two stretches behind me, I've got one. Like a hundred others. But you're going to be bigger. Bigger than all of them. Bigger? Yes. What's the point of being anything if you can't be the biggest, the best? If you can't be number one... <laughs> And that's what we're going to be, Frank. Number one. You're crazy. Wait and see. Look, a couple more bank jobs and we can be driving on gasoline for the rest of our lives. <laughs> that's what my father must have said to my mother. And what were they? Petty crooks. Now they have to live on what I hand out to them. No, darling. We're going to do it right. One real job. And then we quit. What one real job? Never mind. Come on. When we're ready, I'll tell you. Sally! Darling, have I ever given you a bum steer? Well... Have I? No, but... Now empty both barrels like a good boy, and we'll call it quits for today. <laughs> Mr. 
professional criminals don't work alone, they help each other. The most successful are those who get the most help, and they get it through their reputations in the crime world. Sally Hadley learned this the way most people learn things, through experience. She made her husband an expert with a sawed-off shotgun, and then she made herself his press agent. She gave him a name, Shotgun Hadley. She passed out shells as souvenirs. She planned robberies and holdups, saw that he carried them out perfectly. She built up his reputation, and then she was ready. Ready for really big game. Ready for that hot Saturday night in July when an Oklahoma millionaire named Walter Montgomery was playing cards on the screen porch of his home with his wife and his best friend. There's no point in playing with you, Henry. You always win. You and Walter just let me win because I'm your guest. Right, Walter? I'm sorry. What would you say, Henry? Oh, Walt. I thought I heard a car stop down below. You always think you hear something nobody else does. How about another hand? Well, not for me. Me either. I'm about ready for bed. Oh, why don't you... <gasps> Sit down and keep quiet. What are you... Sit down. The shotgun works. Which one of you is Walter Montgomery? Where do you want to know? Never mind. Which one of you is Montgomery? Which one of them is your husband, lady? Okay, I'll take both of them. But you can't... Shut up! Come on on your feet, boys. We're going for a little drive. If you ever want to see your husband again, stay away from the phone, Mrs. Montgomery. I told you the shotgun works. <laughs> One hour later, a blue sedan stopped at an intersection 12 miles from Oklahoma City. A man was shoved out and his empty wallet thrown after him. Then the car continued on its way with Walter Montgomery blindfolded on the back seat. Just about that time, Mrs. Montgomery was putting through a long-distance call. She knew kidnapping was a federal offense, and following the attorney general's advice to the public, she telephoned Mr. J. Edgar Hoover in Washington. In less than 45 minutes, special agents assigned by Mr. Hoover were on their way. They took no immediate action. Not even four days later when Mrs. Montgomery received a typewritten letter. The first of a series of letters. The first of a series of ransom notes. There was this note from my husband enclosed in the letter. Are you sure that's his handwriting, Mrs. Montgomery? Yes. He, he said to give them the $200,000. Well, he certainly said a high price. Did they give you instructions how to pay? Well, the letter says to watch for an ad in the paper. And then take an ad yourself? Yes. Then it told you not to notify the police? Yes. Not to take down the serial number of the bills? And to have only, oh, used $20 notes? How did you know? We haven't been reading your mail. It's just that kidnapping notes always follow the same pattern. Who do they want as the intermediary to deliver the money? Henry, Mr. Carroll. He's my husband's best friend. Well, if they put that ad in the paper tomorrow and you answer immediately, your husband should be back on the first of next week. Unless something happens. What do you mean? Mr. Schuyler. Yes? I want to cooperate with the government. I know kidnappers are the worst kind of criminals. But you see, I... Well, I want my husband back. Please don't do anything. Mrs. Montgomery, there's no need for you to worry. The first concern of the FBI in any kidnapping case is to get the victim home safely. We want to see your husband back here as much as you do. And we won't make one single move that will stand in the way of his coming back. Uh, thank you. Three days later, arrangements were made to have a satchel containing $200,000 thrown from the observation platform of a speeding train at a certain spot in Oklahoma. Although no one knew it, the serial number of every bill was taken down and listed. And nine days after he was kidnapped, Walter Montgomery came home to his wife. He hadn't had much sleep. He was very tired, but he was safe. He was alive. He was home. As soon as he'd recovered from the shock and rested, he was interviewed by the FBI. Ah, Mr. Montgomery. Yes? What was the last thing you saw before being blindfolded? Why, uh, a lot of lights. Must have been some kind of plant. 
Well, there was a power plant near where they dropped Mr. Carroll. It could have been a power plant. All right. Now, on the way to the house, did you hear anything? Well, uh, one or two cars passed us, but... Oh, yes. We must have passed an oil field. Why? I heard the sound of the pumps. And uh, twice I remember smelling gas. Well, then you passed two oil fields. That's right. Now, how long after you passed that second field would you guess it was before you got to the house? Oh, I don't know for sure. Not long, though. Fifteen minutes? Oh, less. I think uh, about ten, say. Good. Now, did the car drive right up to the house, or did they stop for anything? They uh, stopped to open a gate. How do you know? I heard a creak. Mm -hmm. And then they drove right up to the house? No, they drove into some kind of a building. Mm -hmm. A barn, it must have been, because I could smell hay. Well, then the house is probably a farmhouse. Yes. Yes. Was it close to the barn? It was exactly 12 steps away. I counted them. <laughs> Glad you did. Now, tell me. Did you have to go up any steps to the house? Three. And they creaked. Hmm. What happened when you got inside? Well, they put cotton in my ears and taped it over with adhesive so I couldn't hear what they said. Mm -hmm. But every morning I could hear a rooster crow, and then about, uh, oh, less than a minute afterward, the sound of an airplane passing over the house. An airplane? Did you hear it every day? Yes. Uh, no. One day it didn't come. Which day? Well, I, I don't know. But it rained that day. That was Sunday. That's the only day it rained while you were away. And that's the only day you didn't hear the airplane. That's right. I don't know whether this is of any aid to you. At the time, I knew I should try to remember everything that happened so I could be of assistance. Mr. Montgomery, I think you've practically drawn us a map right to that farmhouse. <laughs> For the FBI, anything can be a clue. The lights on a power plant, the smell of an oil field, the sound of an airplane. Using the information gotten from Mr. Montgomery, special agents mapped a circle, a ring around the approximate location of the farmhouse. They went to the airlines, checked schedules, checked flights, checked what line did not run a plane on that one Sunday. They figured over approximately what area the early morning flight passed and the ring around the farmhouse grew smaller tighter, closer. Now the FBI agents moved into the ring looking for the farmhouse. Looking for a farmhouse with a gate wide enough for a car to pass through. A farmhouse with a barn only 12 steps away. 12 steps away from a porch with three creaking stairs. Sorry, I didn't know there was anyone home. Well, you can see I'm home, can't you? <laughs> yes. What do you want? I'm representing a real estate company in Tulsa. We're looking over farms in this neighborhood with a view to buying them. You want to buy this farm? Does it belong to you? Well, it belongs to my daughter, Mrs. Hadley. Sally Hadley? Yes. You know her? <sighs> I've heard of her. Oh, was going to give me the place anyways now. Mm -hmm. You want to buy it? Well, looks like the right place to me. But I'll have to have some of the men in my company look it over this afternoon, if, if it's all right with you. Oh, it's fine with me. You'll be here. Yeah, I'll be here. As long as I can count on seeing you later. Oh, don't worry. You can count on seeing me. Definitely. We momentarily close the Federal Bureau of Investigation file of the case of Shotgun Hadley. We will return to this case in just a moment. In pioneer days, Americans looked to their neighbors for security. When Mrs. Brown was sick abed, neighboring wives came over to help out. If her husband died, 
neighbors saw to it that she and her children had clothes, food, and shelter. But as the nation grew in population, as life became more complex, this neighborly security was no longer sufficient. To take its place in the year 1859, a group of Americans founded the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Today it has grown into a strong mutual organization in which each member enjoys the advantages of association with 3,200,000 good neighbors who have pooled their dollars to protect each other. The equitable management then puts these dollars to work in ways that benefit the entire nation. Equitable funds encourage home ownership. They lend the farmer a helping hand. They finance great industries on which our prosperity depends. So is it not right and proper to speak of life insurance funds as one of democracy's greatest assets? By serving its members, the equitable serves America. And now, back to the file on Shotgun Hadley, Kidnapper. Small things, but enough for the FBI special agents to move swiftly on the trail of the kidnappers. The parents of Sally Hadley were arrested and jailed. Throughout the nation, the FBI sent a list of the serial numbers on the ransom money, sent a description of the kidnapper, sent the call, find Shotgun Hadley. To the FBI, Frank Hadley was another criminal who had to be caught to the nation, he was public enemy number one. To his wife, with whom he shared a hotel suite in St. Louis, Shotgun Hadley was a frightened fool. We don't have to get out of here. Now sit down and cool off, darling. Sally, they've got the serial numbers of this dough. Shall I mix you another drink, too? They've picked up some of the bills already. Frank, will you sit down and relax? Sure. Sit down and wait for them to clap us in jail along with your mother and father. They're not going to put us in jail because they're not going to catch us. They will if we don't get on the move. We'll move. But there's something we've got to do first. What? Sit down. What for? Go on. All right. That's it, darling. Now, you're going to write a letter. A letter? Mm Mm-hmm. Here's a pen and paper. Just write what I tell you. Who the two? Just write what I tell you. Dear Mr. Hoover. What? Are you... Go com- on. Dear Mr. Hoover, while you and your men are knocking yourselves out... Sally, what No, are change you? that to wearing yourselves out. I am living on the fat of the land. Go on, darling. Wait a minute. What's the rest of this going to say? Oh, it's going to say that he'll never catch you because you're too good for him. What? You did this alone, all by yourself, without anyone's help. And you did. What are you trying to do, tie a noose around my neck? Frank, this is a confession. he's got my poor mother and father in jail, and I've got to get them out. For having me confess? Look, he knows you did it anyway. This will just clear my folks and show him that you're not afraid of anyone. It'll just put me in jail instead of them. Oh. You're really afraid of your own shadow, aren't you, darling? Sally, listen. But you listen to me. Now, when I married you, I thought you were a man. I thought you were a man who could be the number one boy in this country. I thought you had guts. Sally, I... What are you afraid of? You are number one now. You've got to show them that. You've got to show them that they're the ones to be afraid. You've got to show them that you're too big to touch. Because you are, Frank. You are. Sally, look. If we mail the letter from here, we... We're not going to. I'm going to send it to a friend of mine in Chicago and have her mail it from there. When they get it, they'll see how big you are. They'll see you don't care. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And then tomorrow, we're going to buy another car, and before they even have a chance to look at the bills, we'll be on our way. Okay, okay, honey, okay. You just don't realize what a big man you've become. Now, what have you written? Dear Mr. Hoover, while you and your men are... Wait. Wait, I've got a wonderful idea. An idea that will top the whole thing off. What now? Hoover may think the letter is from some crank. But do you know what you're going to do? You're going to put your fingerprints on it, darling. You're going to prove this is straight from Shotgun Hadley. From 
From Chicago, from Dallas, from Denver, from cities all over the West come letters to the FBI. And as the letters turn up, money turns up too, ransom money. $20 bills reported by alert citizens to the FBI. $20 bills that put the FBI closer on the trail of Frank and Sally Hadley. But Sally Hadley has gotten impatient. Leaving her husband in a small house near Memphis, she buys a cheap gingham dress, a red wig, and a second-hand car. And with complete unconcern, drives right back to Oklahoma. On the way, she gives a lift to two hitchhikers, a man and his eight-year-old daughter. I guess your little girl is asleep, Mr. Butler. Yeah. She was awful tired. Of course she was. Well, we'll get her a good dinner as soon as we get to town. Oh, you've been so nice, I couldn't let you do anything else for us, ma'am. Oh, don't be silly. I want to. Besides, she reminds me of my own little girl. Oh, do you have one? Yes. By my first husband. He died, poor man, and Frank, that's my second husband, he won't let my little baby live with us. Oh, that's terrible. Well, he isn't a very nice man. He... Mr. Butler. Yeah? Can I trust you? Of course. I'm in terrible trouble, and I've got to speak to somebody. I've just got to get help from someone. Ma'am, if there's anything at all I can do... Well, maybe you won't say that when you know the truth. I'm Sally Hadley, and my husband is Shotgun Hadley. The kidnapper? Yes. Gee. I didn't know what kind of a man he was when I married him. I... Well, it's a little too late for that now, isn't it? But he's done terrible things to me, too, to my little girl, to my family. Oh. Because of him, my poor mother and father are in jail now. And Mr. Butler, I've just got to get them out. But the papers... I are... know, I know, but anything my father and mother did, he made them do at the point of that shotgun of his. Will you do me a favor, please? Will you, will you just go to Oklahoma City and see my lawyer for me? Well, sure, You but... see, I can't go because the police are looking for me. But I want him to get a message to the FBI for me. I want him to tell them that if they will leave my mother and father, I'll tell them where my husband is. Well, I'll be glad to take your message, Mrs. Hadley. Uh, only... Only what? Well, my little girl... Oh, don't worry about her. I'll keep her here with me. Why, she'll be as safe as my own little girl would be. Hello, Skylar speaking. Oh, yes. No, not just yet. I'm trying to reach the Bureau in Washington. May I call you back in a few minutes? Fine. Goodbye. Mrs. Hadley's lawyer again. Pretty anxious for our answer, isn't he? Yes. You suppose he seriously thinks we're going to release the mother and father, Skyler? I don't know. He is Sally Hadley. There's a sweet double-crosser for you. Hmm. Ready to sell out her own husband. Well, if he's half as tough as his reputation, I don't blame her. I wonder if she was crazy enough to come back here to Oklahoma. She might be. We know she hasn't been to a lawyer's office. I don't think we can stall him much longer. We don't have to. He's covered by now, and as soon as we find Sally Hadley's intermediary, we'll find her. And her sharpshooting husband. Right. Will you get Mrs. Hadley's lawyer for me, please? Sally Hadley, waiting in an auto camp outside Oklahoma City for the message from a lawyer, gets frightened. And so Sally Hadley, with a little child as her protection, runs to her husband, who is now in Memphis. Meanwhile, special agents of the FBI located a man in Oklahoma City, a man who was Sally Hadley's intermediary, the man whose eight-year-old child is on her way to a gangster's hideout. Well, now we've got a little eight-year-old girl to worry about, Skyler. Yes. I just hope that Hadley woman is here. Hello. Skyler. You did? Or she went? Hmm. Well, that's that. What? Where's she going? I don't know. Well, we'd better send out a call for a woman driving with an eight-year-old girl. A woman with a red wig. Right. She's probably going back to her husband. That's my guess, too. And they'll probably try to move with a little girl. And... Scholar speaking. Yes. Got it. Right. Right. That was Memphis. Oh. 
Two days ago, a second-hand car dealer down there brought in a flock of those $20 bills. And a man who sells wigs brought in another. I see. And at 4 o'clock this afternoon, a liquor dealer brought in another. Well, I guess I'd better phone my wife and tell her I won't be home for dinner again. Yes, I think we'll be having dinner in Memphis. <laughs> At a quarter to four, one September morning, a little girl sat on the Memphis Railroad Station. A frightened little girl clutching a ticket that would take her back to her father. But a little girl who remembered that she had had supper in a frame house near the edge of the city. And that she had seen a shotgun in that house. At 5.35 that same morning, agents of the FBI and local offices surrounded the frame house. They were armed with guns with guns to battle against the murderous reputation of a man called Shotgun Hadley. It was just beginning to get light when two of them quietly entered the house. They stood for a moment in a dark room. To the left were two doors, two closed doors leading to two bedrooms, leading to Shotgun Hadley. They opened the first. Keep quiet. Who are you? Federal Bureau of Investigation. Federal Bu Oh, thank God. Listen, he's in there. Get him. He ruined my life. That was Sally Hadley, the woman who had planned the kidnapping. The woman who later tried unsuccessfully to convince a jury that she was innocent. The woman who cared no more for her husband than she did for his gun. But she had built up a tremendous reputation for him. And now, as the FBI agents moved to the door of his bedroom, they checked their guns. They tried to anticipate the blast of that shotgun. And then, in a quick movement, they rushed the door to Frank Hadley. There was no battle, no fight, no shooting. Frank Hadley, kidnapper, Frank Shotgun Hadley, public enemy number one, stood against the wall, his hands raised high, his knees shaking. Don't shoot, Jimin. Don't shoot. That was the beginning of the popular use of the phrase G-men. G-men meaning government men, meaning FBI agents. And that was the first and last time Frank or Sally Hadley tried a kidnapping. No kidnapper in this country has ever tried twice once the FBI has caught them. Because the FBI is the largest protective force in the world. You see, it doesn't consist only of a director and a Washington headquarters of field officers and special agents. It also consists of you and all those like you. In every case, it's the cooperation of the people which enables the FBI to find the criminal. And that is the way it should be. Because the FBI, like our government, is created by the people, for the people. It is the people. Have you ever said to yourself, no, I can't possibly buy an extra war bond, and then you find yourself thinking of someone you know in the Army or Navy, your son, and you think, what are your sacrifices compared to his? And so somehow or other you find the money for that extra war bond. Remember the extra satisfaction you felt? Well, that's how members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States feel about the special campaign there. All premium dollars received from new equitable policies written in April will be matched with an equal number of dollars by the equitable. Will be combined total during the seventh war loan bond drive in May. Remember, these war bonds will be over purchases, which amounted to the largest single subscription in both the fifth and sixth dollars. For you, your home. <laughs> The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. In tonight's cast, Sally was played by Leslie Woods and Hadley by Mandel Kramer. The music was under the direction of Van Cleave. 
The author was Lawrence MacArthur, and your narrator was Frank Lovejoy. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI. This is the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company. This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security. And to the Equitable Society, for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight... The story of a peril to the nation. Escape prisoners of war. There are several million Nazis across the sea. Each one of them is a threat to the security of this country. There are several hundred thousand Nazis right here within our borders, prisoners of war. Each one of them who escapes is a threat to the internal security of this country because they are Nazis. And for us, for our democracy, for our way of life, Nazis have but one feeling, contempt. The FBI proved that less than a year ago by a case that broke on the morning of June 19th. Early that sunny morning, two soldiers, two G.I.s, were walking through a patch of woods on their way back to camp. Hey... Now look, Eddie, a rabbit. What am I supposed to do, salute? Gee, did you see him go? Boom, right into the ground. Probably crawled down a hole to sleep. Gee, if he's just down a little hole... What are you pawing around for now? I always wanted to have a rabbit for a pet. All right, so you always wanted a rabbit. This is no time... Hey, Eddie. Yeah? What kind of a rabbit could dig a hole this big... A big rabbit. Come on. Hey, these leaves are just covering up the entrance to a tunnel, it looks like. A beach sake, Mickey. Hey, it is a tunnel. C- come on in. I'm too tired. Oh, come on. What do you got to lose? <laughs> Where's your rabbit? And don't tell me... Oh. What's the matter? It stops here, that's all. Oh, that's great. Now, I suppose we crawl back like a couple of brave pioneers. Hey, wait a second. Help me push this thing up. What thing? Uh, the roof here. Feels like boards or a trap door or something. Yeah, that is... Come on, push. I'm tired. Now, will you push? One, two, three. Eddie, close it. Eddie, you know where we are? Yeah. Right under the barracks of the Nazi prisoners. <laughs> That was on Monday morning, June 19th. But the tunnel had already been used. During the night of the 18th, two Nazi prisoners had escaped. That was in Texas. And immediately, the FBI headquarters in that state were notified by military authorities. They weren't caught unprepared because special arrangements had been made for such an emergency. 
and the special agents went to work immediately. The newspapers, the radio stations, and most important, the local police of Dallas and Fort Worth were notified and given detailed descriptions of the two men. The police radioed warnings to all sheriffs and all peace officers, and broadcasts were also sent out over the Texas State Patrol's network. By late afternoon, the FBI was busy checking the dozens and dozens of reports which kept coming in. Dean speaking. Yes? Yes. Yes, okay. Thanks a lot, Sheriff. All right. Well, that's another lead going, Phil. Which one? Those two fellas spotted fixing a puncture on a back road. Those local police sure get on the job quick. Age 23. What? I was just reading over the description of Tanner. Oh. Lieutenant Paul Tanner of the German Navy. Captured when submarine disabled by depth chart. Dean speaking. Yeah? Uh Uh-huh. I see. Okay, thanks a lot. All right. Which one was that? Those two men seen sleeping in that cemetery. Bad lead? Yes. Something's got to turn up, Dean. Yes, and you know when it does, Hackenberg's going to be easier to spot than Tanner. Because of that scar on his cheek? Yes. Well, with the whole state out on the hunt, there's got to be... Dean speaking. Yes? Yes? Yes. Thanks. Right. Bicycle was stolen from a house one mile from the camp the night of the escape. Bicycle? Yes, and the house was on the same road the prisoners took when they went on labor details. That sounds good. That sounds better than good. Two men on one bicycle. They ought to be easy to spot, Phil. If we can spot them before they get rid of the bike, let's send out a call. Right. Late that afternoon, a truck driver reported seeing two men on a bicycle on the night of the escape. An hour later came another call. A farmer had seen two men on a bicycle the morning after the escape. Then there were no more calls, no more reports. The search was intensified, but by one o'clock on the morning of the 20th, the two Nazis and the bicycle seemed to have disappeared, seemed to have vanished completely. Where were they? At that moment, at one o'clock on the morning of June 20th, they were sitting in a diner. Dressed in blue jeans and khaki shirts, drinking coffee, two escaped Nazis were sitting in an all-night diner in a small town in Texas, USA. You boys want anything with that coffee? No, thanks. You ain't from around here, are you? No. Just passing through? Yes. Where are you heading? Uh, east. East, huh? I know somebody's going east. Maybe we will have something else. Uh, do you have any pie? Sure, what kind you want? Oh, anything that's good. You pick it out. You trust me? Sure. Okay, two pieces? Yes. Okie doke. Whitey, let, let me have two cuts of that peach pie. Okay. Now, Whitey, now. I heard ya. Gee, I'm getting hungry myself. Scramble me up a couple eggs. I just ate an hour ago. Well, I'm a growing girl. Scramble up the eggs, you cheapskate. Here's your pie. Thanks. Toast with them eggs, too. It's peach pie, boys. Don't shoot. I don't think we want the pie after all. But you ordered it. We have to go. Here. You didn't even finish your coffee. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Good night. Huh? How you come with those eggs, Whitey? Oh, keep your shirt on. You'll get them. You can put this pie back. What's the matter? Beats me. Didn't they want it? They didn't want nothing. They even left the coffee. <laughs> Millionaires, eh? Come on, make with the eggs. The griddle ain't hot enough yet. Park yourself. Here, you ring this up. I'll keep the change. How much? Dime. You ain't going to charge him for the pie, are you? I guess not. Hey, what those guys rush out for? Now, how do I know? That griddle looks hot enough to me. You want your toast, though, don't you? And coffee. Uh, how about a steak, too, your highness? Ha, <laughs> ha. Very funny. Oh, 
Marty. Yeah? What's Tonkashin mean? Huh? Tonkashin or Tonkashine. What? One of those fellows said it to me when I brought him the pie. The pie he didn't eat, huh? Yeah. I think I'll have a piece myself. Oh, here. Tonkashin. What? Maybe that's French for what's your telephone number? French? <laughs> Sounds more like German to me. Where do you get German out of that? Listen, when you want to say thank you in German, dope, you say Donke Shane. That's it. That's what he... Whitey. Holy crow. <laughs> That diner was in a small town. But even the smallest town has more than one road leading out of it. And it's never long before a road branches into other roads, into a network of roads, into highways. As soon as the telephone call came in from the diner, the FBI and the local police drove out after the two men on the bicycle, after the escaped Nazi prisoners. They tried to cover all roads. They kept in touch with each other by radio. And they drove fast because they realized that even on a bicycle, a man can make time if he's desperate. Where are we now, Dean? About 20 miles outside of Van Court. Must be awfully strong. Hmm? Who? Whoever's peddling that bike. To get this far so fast. And with a passenger. Yeah, if they're still using the bike. Or if they haven't ducked off into a field. Well, if they have, we should be able to catch them in the morning. <clears throat> the whole area's been alerted. They managed to disappear completely for at least 24 hours so far. I know, Phil, but if we... That is a bicycle, isn't it? Looks like it from here. You have your gun ready? Yes. Dean, do you see anybody on the handlebars? No. Don't tell me it's going to be a farmer out for a joyride. At this hour of the morning? Say. Huh? Pull over to the side there. Where are you going, mister? Vancouver. What for? Why do you want to know? We're federal officers. What's your name? Frank Johnson. Isn't it kind of late to be out for a ride, Mr. Johnson? Oh, my sister just had a baby. I rode over to see her. Oh, from where? Vancourt. You live there? Yes. Can we see your draft card, please? I'm sorry I forgot it. You know how it is when you get a call that the baby... What's the matter? Where'd you get that scar on your cheek? Germany. Where's Lieutenant Tanner? I really could not say, but probably very well taken care of. What do you mean? Americans are extremely hospitable and just as stupid. I think you'd better get in the car, Hackenberg. Captain Hockenberg. Captain Hockenberg. Thank you, sir. By morning, the Texas newspapers and radio stations had spread the report. One prisoner was captured, but the other was still at large. An escaped Nazi was still free, was still somewhere in the vicinity of Van Cort, Texas. The cooperation of every citizen was requested, and the response was fast. Report after report came into the FBI and the state and local police. Report after report was checked and followed up. The most promising came from a doctor. Well, gentlemen, I was coming home from a late call, and just as I passed that filling station outside San Angelo, I noticed a man climbing into the back of this truck. About what time was that, Doctor? Oh, I left the hospital at 2. I guess that was about 5 after. What did the man look like? Well, to tell the truth, I didn't notice him much or think much about it. So I heard the radio broadcast about the escaped prisoners this morning. Now, thank you, Doctor. We appreciate your help. That doesn't sound like much help. It doesn't even sound like a real clue. But the FBI checks everything, every report. Special agents immediately call the owner of the San Angelo filling station. He remembered selling gas to a truck driver a little after two in the morning before but he'd only seen one man on the truck. From the gas coupon, the agents learned the license number of the truck. From the license registration, they learned the name and address of the owner. 
And then they went to him to see what they could learn from the truck itself. You can see for yourself, I'm here fixing a blowout like it was. Anybody could hop on the back without me seeing them. Would be pretty easy, don't you think, Dean? Well, let's see if there's anything in the back to prove that Nazi was riding with you. Well, what you looking for? Oh, lots of things. Fingerprints? <laughs> yeah, but with all this cloth back here, I doubt if we'll find any. The surface is too soft to... Phil, you have your flashlight? Sure. Shine it over here, will you? Is that your hatchet, Mr. Lang? Yeah, use it to open crates. You mind if we borrow it to send to our laboratory for a fingerprint check? No, sir, it's all... Hey. What? Well, that Nazi could have been riding the back of my truck and picked up my hatchet. Hey, I had a pretty narrow escape. Well, we don't know yet whether he was the one. Even so... Wait he... a minute. Shine that flash over here, Phil. Right. Yeah, this may be something. That? Sure. Why, well, that's just a little piece of thread. Here's an envelope for it, Dean. Thanks. This little piece of thread, Mr. Lang, is going to take a long trip to our laboratory in Washington. What for? They'll find out what kind of a shirt it came from. And I got a hunch it came from the kind of shirt worn by prisoners of war. The hatchet and the piece of thread arrived at the FBI laboratory in Washington on the morning of June 21st. That afternoon, the result of the examination was teletyped to special agents in Texas. From a small piece of thread, from one fingerprint on the blade of a hatchet, there was proof, conclusive proof, that the hitchhiker on the back of the truck had been Lieutenant Paul Tanner of the German Navy. But where had he gone? Where was he now? An escaped prisoner of war, a Nazi, was still at large in the state of Texas. We momentarily close the Federal Bureau of Investigation file of the case of escaped Nazi prisoners of war. We will return to this case in just a moment. It is the year 1872. A distinguished army officer, a young man with golden hair that reaches to his shoulders, is about to sign his name to an application for membership in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. The Indians of the Western Plains call him White Chief with the yellow hair. But you and I will know him better by the name he is signing on the equitable application. So let's watch his pen as it writes, George Armstrong Custer. Brevet Major General, USA. A name that has also been inscribed for all time on the roll of America's immortal soldiers. Now, we do not know what led General Custer to choose the equitable. But we do know that he showed sound judgment. For in four wars and through seven major depressions, this society has never failed to meet a single financial obligation. And for 86 years, equitable funds have marched in the vanguard of American progress. Equitable dollars helped build the railroads. They promoted the growth of our greatest industries. They helped grow wheat in Minnesota, oranges in California, cotton in Texas. So by serving its members, the equitable serves America. And now, back to the file on Paul Tanner, escaped prisoner of war. When a convict escapes jail or when a Nazi escapes prison camp, it is fairly easy to catch him during the first two or three days because the trail is fresh. But after that, just as rain can blot out footprints, the trail can disappear into nowhere. That's what happened to the trail of Paul Tanner, former lieutenant on a German submarine. The search continued all through the summer. Reports came in, but by September, Tanner was still free. Where was he? Still in Texas. As a matter of record, he was working as a hired hand for a farmer named Allen, working under the name of Gene Meyer, working to get enough money to escape to Mexico. Gene! Gene. Yes, Sticky. Gene, look what I got done. Uh, Dickie, don't start pestering Gene with those model airplanes or whatever they are. But, Pa, we want He worked hard today and he wants to rest. Oh, that's okay, Mr. Allen. Let me see what you got done today, Dickie. Uh, say, Gene, are you going to have to go back to that hospital? Oh, no. 
Merchant seamen aren't like Army or Navy. We're pretty free. Should I glue this on now? Uh-huh. That's right. Still, it's funny they let you do what you wanted after you got out of the hospital. <laughs> what do you mean, funny? A little further down, Dickie. Right. Well, not making you go back to sea. I told you. I decided to work, to build up my health. Well, I ought to just pray that they let you finish out the harvest. Every time the mail comes, I... Say, that's no model airplane. Whoever said it was, Pa? Anybody can tell it's a submarine. A submarine? Where'd you learn about submarines? Gene drew the plans for it. Oh, it looks just like a picture, one I saw. Ready. Oh, nuts. Come on, Gene. We'll finish after supper, Dickie. You wash your hands, Dickie. I did. Wash them again. Oh, Pa. Well, that's a darn good submarine. I guess you... <laughs> What's the matter? Oh, I was going to say it's probably model of a sub you was on yourself, and then I remembered. Remembered what? Mm, they don't have merchant seamen on submarines. Come on, let's see. <laughs> Sit down, Mr. Allen. Oh, thank you, sir. Sheriff Ulster said you might have some information for me. Well, I don't know for sure, sir, but I... Well, I think my hired hand's that Nazi prisoner you've been looking for. What makes you think so? Well, uh, he's been helping my little boy build model planes and stuff, uh, you know. Yeah, sure. Well, last night I got a look at something they were making. It was from some plans this fella drew. And you know what the darn thing was? A Submarine? Submarine? Yeah, and I got to thinking about it in bed last night. It looked just like the real thing, and I was Excuse wondering... Excuse me, Mr. Allen. Sir? Yeah, look at this photograph. You sure? Why? Why, that's him. Let's go, Phil. Is this his room, Mr. Allen? Yes, sir. Where is he now? Well, I left him cutting hay down by, near the river bottom. I think I'll go over there. Right, Phil. Doesn't have much stuff of his own, does he? No. Nothing you don't see, except that little zipper bag there. Let's have a look at it. Sure. Here you are. Huh. I wonder where he picked this up. It doesn't seem to be... What is it? Something in the lining here. A book. It's a diary. Hmm. June 20th. We had a close call today. H completely forgot himself in a restaurant. He sure did. I am a soldier of the Reich, and I must get back to the fatherland. Did he write that junk? It's not junk to him, but to people like him, Mr. Allen. That's something a lot of us don't realize. Listen to this. These Americans are stupid fools. This miserable country will cry for help when the Fuhrer lets loose his secret weapons, and I will be there to help him. That fellow's crazy. Well, he's a Nazi. Dean. Yes? He's gone. What? Not a sign of him in the field. He was there when I left. Did he see you go? Sure. Did he ask why you were going? Well, I said for supplies. Guess he knew you didn't go to town often and got suspicious. He must have cleared out right after Mr. Allen did. Why? There was a jug of water next to the mower, and it's full to the top. But where did he go? I don't know where he went, but I know where he was heading. Where? Galveston. He's got it in his diary. Thirty more dollars, and I'm ready to leave for Galveston, then Mexico. I guess he didn't wait for his thirty dollars. Mr. Allen, that river down there. Oh, he'd take you to Galveston, all right. Once I rode there, me and Dickie and... Rode there in what? An old flat bottom I have. Did you have it beached right near the hayfield? Yeah. I followed some footprints down there. Your boat's gone, Mr. Allen. And that Nazi in it? Yes. And if, if he gets to Galveston... Mr. Allen, I don't think he will. The Brazos River winds its way through Texas to Galveston. And along its banks are reeds, tall grass, foliage thick enough to hide a man in a flat bottom boat. They hid Paul Tanner for the rest of that hot afternoon. But by nightfall, sheriffs, deputies, state patrolmen, local police, and citizens from all around had joined in the hunt. By nightfall, FBI agents were in planes and motorboats watching the river. 
and keeping contact with each other by walkie-talkie radios. By nightfall, there was a moon, a bright moon that stripped the river of shadows and made it a clear field of vision for a plane flying above. Moving upstream toward the bridge. Nothing yet from up here. We're moving up too, Dean. But this boat's running low on gas. Well, you think you can hold out about... Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Phil. I just saw a reflection of moonlight on... on something that... Yes, there it is again. Looks like a wet paddle. Close to the right shore, heading downstream. It's about a quarter of a mile above Dead Man's Bend now. Just below Hempstead. He's moving closer to shore, though. Looks like he's trying to land. Come on. Give her everything you've got. There he is. He's trying to make sure. Cut her off. Stay where you are, I'll shoot. I warn you, Tanner, stay where you are. Or... Okay. Come on, jump aboard. Well, you led us a fine chase. Who's in command here? In command? Yes. I am. Heil Hitler! At this moment, there are approximately 390,000 prisoners of war in this country. Most of them are Nazis, and each one is a potential threat to our safety. Alert citizens and cooperative law enforcement officers have aided your FBI in the quick apprehension of escaped prisoners of war before they could commit army acts of sabotage. But they remain a menace. Any information on an escaped prisoner should be reported immediately to the FBI. A Nazi may have been a prisoner in this country for a year or for two years. He may have had a chance to learn something about us, about our democracy, about our way of life. Don't think, however, that his objective has changed. It hasn't. He is still a threat to our security, still a menace, because he is still a Nazi. In these days, young Americans are fighting and dying all over the world. So the question, what are you doing here at home to help win the war, is one that deserves a straightforward answer from every American citizen, from every American organization. Members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States may take pride in their society's answer to that question. In the Equitable Service flag are 2015 stars. Here at home, Equitable agents and employees are backing up their fellow workers in the fighting forces by selling thousands of war bonds in every drive, by giving hundreds of blood donations, and by performing all the other services that are expected of patriotic citizens in wartime. Of the funds that have been entrusted to the Equitable Society by its members, 44% has been invested in government bonds. In both the fifth and sixth war loan drives, the Equitable made the largest single subscription, each subscription amounting to $500 million. In wartime, equitable dollars are fighting dollars. And at all times, they are security dollars. For you, your home, and your country. The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. In tonight's cast, Tanner was played by Paul Mann. The music was under the direction of Van Cleave. The author was Lawrence MacArthur, and your narrator was Frank Lovejoy. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. <laughs> The 
This is the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company. There are no major developments in the war news to report. Any new developments will be brought to you immediately. Keep tuned to your Blue Network station. This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security and to the Equitable Society for Financial Security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight, the story of a crime against society, the confidence game. There are some people who seem to wait for laws to be made so that they can break them. Break them and make money doing so. To those people, a curfew means a speakeasy. A price ceiling means a black market. A war means a high-pitched, gullible nation. They like war, those people, because they can make money out of it in a hundred different ways. Sooner or later, they all get caught, but they try. They try every angle that a nation at war provides, and they try it in the most innocent places. Places like... Well, take the sunny boardwalk overlooking the ocean at a resort near New York. Tilt your face up, Abby. Let the sun get at it. It only brings out my freckles, Lily. Or else I start peeling. Oh, it's good for the bones. Oh, I wish we were really on vacation from school. But I can't help feeling a little guilty about spending money in wartime. I think of poor Mrs. Greenway and... Mm, she hasn't heard from her son yet? No. She's hoping he's a prisoner of war in Germany, I but... I beg your pardon, oh. ladies. I, I couldn't help overhearing you mention the name Greenway. Do you by any chance know the lad's first name? Well, I... Uh... Forgive my rudeness, but I've just come back from overseas myself, and I thought perhaps... Oh, his name is Herbert. Isn't that it, Abby? Uh, yes. Herbert Greenway? Do you know him? Yes, quite well. Oh, Abby, is he all right, do you know? Madam, you can tell a lad's mother to rest easy. Exactly eight days ago, the Russians freed him from a German prison camp. Oh, then he was a prisoner. Oh, oh it's so Lily. nice of you to tell us. Uh, uh, Major? Major. Uh, Major William Evans Roscoe, at your service, miss. That is, I hope it's miss. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, I'm Miss Tompkins, and this is Miss Bergen. How do you do? Most charming pleasure. You see, I happen to know about the Greenway boy because... May I sit down? Oh, oh, please oh, do. Of course, move over, Lily. Yes. Thank you. Now, as I said, I've only just returned from some very secret work overseas in connection with prisoners. I leave for Washington shortly to make my report. Oh, oh when? Well, oh, not, not for a day or so. Oh. I've been granted a short leave, but I... Well, frankly, I, I don't know anyone in the city, and... Would you ladies think it very presumptuous if I asked you to... Join me for dinner tonight? Oh, it would be a pleasure, Major. Miss Bergen? Well, Lily, you know I promised the Perkins. Oh, yes. I'm very sorry. Some other time, perhaps? I'd like to. But I will have the pleasure of your company, Miss Tompkins. Well... Please, take pity on a lonely serviceman. You know, I haven't had a real meal or charming company for... Well, let's not say how long. Oh. Major? Yes? Uh... Wouldn't you prefer a good home-cooked meal? Well, as a matter of fact... Oh, I'd be so honored. Well, I, 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 I couldn't. Oh, please, it would make me very happy. And it's the least a civilian could do. Well, in that case, I'm at your service, ma'am. <laughs> in... 
know, Lily, there are two things about you that I find very hard to believe. Major. One is that you cooked that most excellent dinner all by yourself. Well, I did. And the other is that you're really not married or engaged. Oh, Bill. I look at you and I... Uh, what's the matter? I, I, I think I better go. Why? Because I, I, I can't do this anymore. Lily, forgive me for what I'm going to say. Bill, I, I don't understand. Can you understand the feeling of... Oh, lost time that war gives a man? Can you forgive it? Can you forgive me for saying, Lily, that... I love you? Bill, I... I, I know we've only just met, but I... I want to run out and buy you flowers, buy you champagne, buy you... Lily, I, I want to buy you a ring, an engagement ring. An, an engagement? Wait, you, don't, you don't have to say yes this minute. You don't have to answer at all. I know it's sudden for you, but I want to... What, what Bill? <sighs> Funny. Here I am talking of buying a ring and thinking of running out and getting one first thing in the morning and I have exactly $47 in my wallet. But, Bill, that's... No, the... it's not enough, my dearest. Not for a ring for you. Oh, now, Bill, listen. No, 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 no. Let me think. My bank's in Philadelphia. Do you suppose they'd honor a check here in New York? Bill, I refuse well, to Lily, let you... Lily, what's money for but something like this, something with someone like you? Well, now, my army credentials... Oh, darn it, they're secret. Lily, if you endorse the check, not for much, say $50... Oh, no, no, I, I, I couldn't ask you. But why not? Why couldn't, that's all. You, you... Well, well, we're going to be engaged. Oh, Lily. So, what I have is yours. And what I have is yours. Lily, I really do love you. The world is filled with people looking for love. And people in love forget to ask questions. They don't care. Lily Tompkins didn't ask, didn't care, didn't know. Didn't know that when Major William Roscoe left her house that night with a check for $50 in his pocket, he walked quickly to the nearest subway station. Not because he was in a hurry to catch that train, but because he had an appointment. An appointment he had made that very afternoon. Miss Bergen! Miss Bergen! Major! Oh, Major, I hope I haven't kept you waiting long. I've been waiting all evening. Oh. Uh, that sounds like a pretty speech, but it's true. Did... Uh... Did Lily say anything? Oh, no. I knew she didn't hear us on the boardwalk, and if she had, I wouldn't have cared. I, I really never should have done this. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Oh, no. You don't understand. I mean... Abby, forgive me for what I'm going to say. I don't understand. Well, can you understand the feeling of... Oh, lost time that war gives a man? Can you forgive it? Can you forgive me for standing here on a lonely subway platform and saying, Abby, I love you? The confidence game requires only two players. A gullible, rather lonely woman, for example and a man with a great deal of charm and absolutely no scruples. It's an old game, but it becomes a particularly nasty one when a new twist is added. A twist of taking advantage of a war. Still, it's a game, and like all games, it can't last, particularly when checks are involved. Sooner or later, those checks turn up at the FBI. Are these the checks, Robbie? Yes. Both for $50 and... Both returned marked no account. Didn't those women ask the major for any credentials? They felt the uniform was enough. And the army never even heard of William Evans Roscoe. Probably an alias. Yeah. 
Well, it's a low trick, all right, to use the uniform of a... Well, he won't be wearing it long. Is the laboratory reported on his handwriting yet? We're waiting for a teletype from Washington now. Fifty dollars from two school teachers. Two checks. And one within ten hours of the other. Which makes me think he's an old hand. I'm looking forward to that report from Washington on Major Roscoe. When a handwriting specimen sent to the FBI laboratory in Washington is identified, the work does not stop there. In a sense, it just begins because agents immediately begin investigating the man concerned. In this case, while the FBI was checking, the criminal who called himself Major Roscoe decided to leave the city and go to a mountain resort. It would be cooler in the mountains. It would be relaxing. And besides, there would be lots of women. Lots of unattached, lonely women. When my plane caught fire, naturally, there was nothing for me to do but bail out. And that was when the Japanese fired at you? Yes. Of course, I got the Purple Heart, but... But what, Major? Well, I'd, I'd rather not talk about it, Miss Hudson. Of course. Oh, I wish I were a man. Why? Well, I could have the kind of life you have now. Personally, I prefer the life I led before I fulfilled my obligation to my country and joined up. What did you do before the Army, Major? Exactly what I wanted to do at the moment. If I felt the urge to go to China, the South Seas, I'd take, oh, 30000 out of the bank and go. It always takes money to do things like that. I could probably go as far as uh, Chicago, I guess. Oh, oh, now, now, now. You must have more than $100 in the bank. Well, I do, but... Uh, how much? Just a little. Barely 7000 Well, where's your spirit of adventure? Take that and just... Pick up and go. Oh, yes. I've always wanted to. I've always felt that I... I... I don't know why I talk like this to you. I do. You do it because you know that... I understand. Yes. I think you do. Martha, can you forgive me for what I'm about to say to you? Say to me? For the... Well, from the first moment I saw you, I, I, I knew don't. that... Don't. Please, Major, don't say oh, that. Oh, Martha. No, please. Don't you see how much it would mean to a woman like me? Don't you see how seriously I would take it? Martha, I know. And I know how I feel. You... You mean... Yes, Martha. You want to marry me? Yes, Martha, I do. Oh, William. Well, what's the matter, my dear? I just never thought I'd be happy. And I am. I am now for the first time in my life. Two days later, another check marked no account turned up at FBI headquarters in New York. Another check signed by Major William Evans Roscoe. A check that Major Roscoe had cashed at a resort in the mountains. Now the trail, the path, the road that led to Major Roscoe was getting shorter. Much shorter. For the agents went at once to the resort to see the manager and then the major. Well, really, gentlemen, if you can't accept a check from a major in the United States Army and a major who's been decorated and wounded, Lord knows what else... Did I... you ask to see his credentials? Well, no, but after all, his uniform Unfortunately, is Unfortunately, to... the uniform is not enough of a credential. Not with people like Major Roscoe around. By the way, has the major been very friendly with any particular woman? Yes, with uh, Miss Hudson. Very nice lady, I... Miss Hudson, huh? Miss Martha Hudson. We'd better see her right away, Leo. Oh, you, you can't. She's gone, too. Too? Oh, yes. They both checked out yesterday, and he paid for both. By check? Yes. By check. You have Miss Hudson's home address? Yes, I'll get it for you. Check. check. A day too late. Yes. Laboratory report on his handwriting certainly indicted him. The Major has quite a record. He's been operating for almost five years under about 20 different names. I think we'll catch him this time. That isn't what worries me. What then? 
I was thinking of a Miss Martha Hudson of the report from Washington that the Major's been married twice. And both wives died almost immediately after the wedding. We momentarily close the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on the fraudulent major. We will return to this case in just a moment. Since the dawn of history, men have been fighting to win security. First, security against marauding enemies. Then, security against the despotic power of kings and nobles. Freedom of speech and religion, trial by jury, protection against arbitrary arrest and imprisonment. These are some of the great securities which our ancestors bought for us with their blood and their lives. In the last century, men set out to win still another security for themselves. It was freedom from money worries, protection against the financial uncertainties of the future. And to this end, in the year 1859, a group of Americans founded the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Their idea was that by joining forces, by combining their dollars into a common protective fund, maximum security for each individual member would be achieved. Self-help and self-reliance. Voluntary cooperation by men willing to work together in ways that benefit the entire community. That's the American way. That's the equitable way. By serving its members, the equitable serves America. And now, back to the file on William Roscoe, confidence man. <laughs> A man signs an assumed name to a check and defrauds a woman of $15. He's done it before many times. He's never been caught, and he sees no reason why he should be now. But the FBI has his record. They know his method of operation. And now, on a train returning to New York, they are finally on his trail. The description we got at the hotel fits the one of the report, all right. 5'11", 174 pounds, scars on his forehead... The manager said the major claimed he got those scars in the Pacific, fighting Japs. Well, it shouldn't take long to get to the Hudson woman's house from the station. She lives with a brother and sister-in-law. What? Oh, yes. What are you thinking about? Same thing you are. What that chambermaid told us? Yes. Well, just because the major carries a gun, it doesn't mean... I know. I wish this train would move a little faster. So do I. That train was due in New York at 3.45 p.m., but it was 10 minutes late. And at 3.50 p.m., Major Roscoe was waiting in the railroad station, waiting to board a train, waiting to board a train with his bride-to-be, Martha Hudson. You sure you got everything, Martha? Of course, Edna. Now, don't worry so. Oh, I just wish I could be with you in Boston for the wedding. Well, I wish you could be with your sister, too, Mrs. Hudson, but army orders, you know, there's nothing I can do. Of course not. Stop getting so upset, Edna. Well, I can't help it if I care more about your own sister than you. Oh, Martha. Edna, now don't cry. I'm just so happy for there, you. There, there, my dear. Don't you think Martha's safe in my hands? Oh, yes, that's just it. it. It's all so wonderful. Oh, for Pete's sake. Let me have your handkerchief, Harry. Uh, Martha, my dad, I think we better... Yes, William. Harry? Sis, I... Well, all the luck in the world to you. Thanks. I think I've got it now. Goodbye, Edna. Goodbye, honey. Goodbye, Major. Take care of her. I'll do my best. Well, Harry, old man. Goodbye, sir. Thanks for everything. I can't tell you how... Oh, oh, the tickets. Will Holy you? mackerel. Here they are. Uh, thanks for picking them up. Oh, forget it. Uh, you've got my check. Sure. Well, goodbye, then. Goodbye. 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 Well, 
You did enough weeping for a dozen weddings. I know, but I'm so happy for her, Harry. Yes, so am I. She always pretended that she didn't care about not being married, but... Sure. And you know, when it's your own sister, you... You feel kind of lousy, honey. Well, it's all right now, Harry. The Major's a wonderful man. He sure is. That was a beautiful ring he gave her. Must have cost a fortune. It did. Five hundred bucks. How do you know? His bank's in Philadelphia, so I endorsed the check for him. Oh. Say, Harry, who's that man waiting on our front steps? I don't know. Gee, I hope... What? Nothing. Uh, Pardon me. Yes? I'm looking for a Miss Martha Hudson. I'm afraid you'll have to go to Boston to find her, mister. Boston? Yes, she just left to be married there. To a Major Roscoe? Yeah. Say, who are you, anyway? Special agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Gee, Martha hasn't done anything, has she? No. The person we're looking for is the man who calls himself Major Roscoe. I knew it, Edna. I knew it was too good to be true. There is not a section of this country that is not covered by the FBI. Before a train carrying Major Roscoe and Martha Hudson could have arrived in Boston, special agents in that city were notified by teletype to be on the watch. When the train arrived, they were at the station. There was no sign of the Major or Martha Hudson. The agents checked all the hotels, the rooming houses, the churches, but there was no trace of the missing couple. A report was teletyped back to New York, and the special agents there immediately paid another call on Martha Hudson's brother and sister-in-law. Mr. Hudson, are you certain that your sister and the Major left for Boston? I can't be certain of anything anymore. Harry... I'm sorry, honey. We know this has been a pretty bad shock, Mr. Hudson, but we're trying to find your sister. Did you put them on the Boston train? No, we said goodbye to them in the station. Maybe they got off before Boston. We're checking on that. But there's also the possibility they never started for Boston. I picked up the tickets myself. Did you see them? No. I just picked up the envelope, paid for it, and never looked inside. You say you paid for the tickets? Yes. Do you remember how much they cost? Sure. The major gave me his personal check for them. Here. Thank you. This check's for $20.38. That's the price. Yes, but that's not the price of two tickets to Boston. That's the price of two tickets to Washington. William... Why did you tell Harry and Edna we were going to Boston instead of Washington? Oh, just the incurable romanticist in me, I guess. This way we seem like two carefree youngsters running off to this hotel secretly. Oh, William, we're going to have such a wonderful life. Oh, dear. What's the trouble? In all the confusion of getting away, I didn't have time to get to the bank. I I stripped myself of cash. That's all right. I have some. It's a fine way to begin our life together. What do you mean? Borrowing from you. Oh, it's not borrowing. Whatever I have is yours anyway. I wish you didn't have a single penny. Why? I suppose it's because at heart I'm old-fashioned, my dear. But I wish you were completely dependent on me. I wish you had to come to me for every penny. William, may I have your pen? What are you going to do? The pen, please. Here. Thank you. I'm going to make myself completely dependent on you because, well, because I'm old-fashioned, too. But but what's that check for? All I have. Oh, my dear. I knew, I I, I knew from the very beginning that you were the woman I always... Who's that? It's a bellboy, I guess. I ordered some champagne for us. Oh, William. Yes? Major Roscoe? At your service, gentlemen. Would you step out into the hall for a moment? Who are you? Special agents of the FBI. William? Uh, Just some military matters, my dear. Nothing to be alarmed about. I'll be back in a moment. Now then, gentlemen. I think you know what we're here for. My dear man, 
man. I really haven't the slightest idea. You mind if we search you? For a weapon? Yes. Well, the only weapon I carry is right here in my pocket. My checkbook. What we'd like to talk with you about concerns checks and impersonation. Oh? We have quite a few of your checks. One endorsed by a Miss Lily Tompkins, another by a... No, you don't! Uh, my checkbook. I know. I'll take that checkbook, Major. What is it, 38 automatic? Yes. Handy little gun you had there, Major. Not quite handy enough, it seems. But you know, gentlemen, I should have known from personal experience that as a weapon, the checkbook is much better than the gun. Shall we go? Very often, people will believe things because they want very badly to believe them. But too often, other people, criminals, confidence men will take advantage of this desire, even to the extent of impersonating an officer of the United States Army. Every representative of this country, every government employee carries credentials. Credentials that you should examine carefully. This is a duty you owe not only to yourself, but to your country. And to the protectors of our internal security, the FBI. These criminals can be among the most difficult to catch. But with the full cooperation of the decent citizens of our nation, they can be the easiest. We'll hear about the file on next week's case in just a minute. Yesterday, somewhere on the island of Okinawa, a young American infantryman stepped on a landmine. It blew up in his face. Today, both of that boy's legs are going to be amputated. Compared with his sacrifice, anything that any of us does here at home seems trifling. Nevertheless, while we can't do as much as the men and women at the front, we can do our best. And that best is vitally important to victory. So it'll be a source of satisfaction to equitable members to learn that 44% of this society's assets are now invested in war bonds and government securities. Recently, Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable, pointed out what this means. He said, quote, For every one of its 3,200,000 members, the Equitable now owns government bonds amounting to $490. For each member, an additional $220 is invested in industries and utilities which manufacture weapons of war. Plus $115 per member invested in railroads engaged in war transportation. That's another reason why we say that in wartime, equitable dollars are fighting dollars. And at all times, they are security dollars. For you, your home, and your country. Next week, a crime against our fighting men, war fraud. The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. Any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. In tonight's cast... William Roscoe was played by Arnold Moss and Martha by Charlotte Holland. The music was composed and directed by Van Cleve. The author was Lawrence MacArthur and your narrator was Frank Lovejoy. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time, for this is your FBI. This is the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company.